right, we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to introduce you to you, Ben Yu, Board Chair ACC. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Business Resilience Series. It is a part of a Business Conference pre-conference series, and we're going to uh, have uh, four uh, sessions, and today is uh, the first one. Uh, before uh, Paul introduce our uh, speaker, Larry, I, I want to uh, uh, introduce our uh, uh, CEO or the president of National Aids, Chi Ling, uh, uh, to give us uh, uh, a few words. This will not happen, this whole series will not happen without Chi Ling's leadership and National Aids support. Uh, this part of the uh, uh, National Aids uh, initiative to working with uh, and different uh, chambers, local chambers uh, in 50 states and to uh, promote uh, helping the business owners, uh, minorities uh, through this uh, difficult time. Uh, just a quick introduction, National Aids is the National a Asian Chamber Commerce and uh, Entrepreneurs. Uh, Cheating is the president and CEO of National Aids. Under her leadership and under National Aids, people probably didn't know they have uh, webinars, different events almost on a weekly basis and been working with the different chambers and the minority organizations and to support many business owners and the individuals and the uh, minority companies uh, um, in their growing their business. So with that being said, um, it's an honor to uh, have Chiling to uh, say a few words to us. Chiling, please. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. National AIDS is a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is to serve as a strong advocate of Asian American Pacific Islander business interests and affect a positive change on all issues that enhance and advance the goals and aspirations of AAPI business owners. For the past six months, we have worked closely than ever with our national network of more than 60 affiliate chambers and partners around the country to ensure that AAPI business community has, has the most accurate and up-to-date information about the important resources that are available to our community during this global pandemic. One of our strongest partners is the Asian Chamber of Commerce of Houston. We are so thankful to being you, Paul Gore, Barbara, and everyone, all the board of directors, all the uh, committee members and volunteers at the Houston Chamber for providing the space for this discussion today and allowing us to have an interactive forum on very important issues, knowing your rights. And uh, it's just so proud because the uh, Asian Chamber of uh, Houston has done ex extraordinary work. I, I just cannot describe you. And they have a connect Houston and Texas to Washington DC and also nationwide. Uh, as many of you know, we are now just beginning to see data of the impact of COVID-19 has had on the AAPI business community. That is really heartbroken whatever happened uh, to our community. A recent report of JP Morgan Chase showed that the balance of Asian owned business declined 22% in early April. At the end of March, revenues of AAPI business were over 60% lower than that they were in the prior year. Overall, Asian owned uh, business have experienced severe damage to cash balance and revenue, and they are going to require more assistance from the federal government to fully recover. So please check our website at acesmallbusiness.org, and we will provide our technical assistance and also service uh, without charge. And thank you again, and Larry, we're really looking forward you know, to listen to your webinar, and this is one of the series, so I really wish all audience can stay with us the rest of this week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chiling. Um, I appreciate your just introduction and, and it's wonderful that we have this partnership um, and even more so to hear Larry. Um, I'm just gonna introduce myself. My name is Paul Gore, Director of the Community Development for the Asian Chamber of Commerce here. Um, we welcome you for our pre-conference, our billion, uh, Business Resilience Series of September 23rd, 2020. 
As you know, the Asian Chamber has been really monitoring the COVID-19 situation since January, affecting our Asian business here in Houston. We're really happy to put this together uh, with our national partner, ACE, National ACE. And this is, webinar is the first of four series focused on legal, communication, cybersecurity, and human resource, which is basically human resource law. Today, uh, we're happy to have Larry Finder, Senior Counsel at Baker McKenzie, who has really extensive experience in government in investigations, corporate compliance, counseling, federal grand jury, trial practice, uh, in internal investigations, and business crimes. He has a wealth of experience consulting personal and business rights for those inside the U.S. So I hope that you find this presentation useful in understanding your legal rights here and as you live in this great country of America. You know, the Asian Chamber is an organization that celebrates 30 years helping Asian business community to foster economic trades among our, our members. And this is a very crucial time and topic to learn about resources that, uh, that allow you to help you through this uncertain and trying times. You know, but before we, we start and continue with this webinar, I'd like to just provide some housekeeping items. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, uh, which you can ask by pressing the button on the bottom, the Q&A button on the bottom on the control panel, and you'll be able to ask there where you can type it, and you can do this in the middle of the webinar, and uh, please submit your questions there, and we'll ask them on your, your behalf. Next, um, you know, please take note of, uh, that we're going to try to answer all the questions, but because of time, please forgive us if we can't be able to answer your question. Just want to let you know ahead of time. And lastly, the presentation will be recorded, so we'll make it available um, both on the National ACE Resource website as well as our website, the Chamber website, at the end of the presentation. So you know, please stay engaged and don't worry about taking notes. So we really want you to be focused and, and allow you to really process all the information that we're going to be covering in this short amount of time. So. With that, um, I want to be able to just talk a little bit of just some of the upcoming programs. If you can look at the, the slides, um, we're going to have our business expo, or actually business conference expo coming up in two weeks. Um, it's going to be a four day over two weeks. Um, and as you know, this is a pre-conference uh, session and that really leads up to the business conference itself. Uh, we have wonderful speakers. We, we did announce uh, yesterday, Secretary Ross will be one of our keynotes to open up the um, the session and the conference itself. Um, and even more so, it's, uh, there's two topics that we're gonna be talking about, uh, both business tools in our first week and then trade both locally and internationally um, in week two. It's a wonderful experience to, and highly interactive where we'll have a, a main session, a breakout session, as well as one-to-one -one conversations that you can have internally with the participants, as well as scheduling your meetings and a, an exhibitor hall where we're having over 50 exhibitors gonna be present there. So it's a wonderful uh, low cost um, webinar or sorry, business conference that we're going to be having. And we want to you to be able to register. Um, af actually, those attending here will get a discount code afterwards uh, that will arrive next tomorrow. Um, and you'll be able to register at a discount price just to show our appreciation and, and really uh, maximize your time and value um, with this conference itself. And the other thing I want to be able to highlight is in continuing our series, next week we're going to have one that's about communication, um, being able to understand and, and communicate well as you're social distancing from, from um, the. It's a wonderful event uh, by two highly um, marketable um, companies who, who really show and, and guide other companies and how to really brand and market their, their products and services. So that's a free event happening at the same time next Wednesday. So with that, Oh, oh, one more thing, our, our new app. You can download our app online and really be able to engage. Uh, it's an, in everything at the, the fingertip of your hand and your mobile phone. So please download it if you haven't do that. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to um, Larry, who will be able to introduce and, and have a wonderful thing. So Larry, I'm gonna stop the screen and if you can just press the button to, to start sharing screen and the floor is yours. All right. Well, I want to thank ACC Houston and National Ace for inviting me to speak. And I want to thank each of you on this webinar for taking 60 minutes of your time to uh, listen to me. Uh, but a, a special thanks for uh, Paul, Bin, Xi Ling, and Barbara for helping me uh, get to this point today. What I'm prepared to uh, share with you is a 30,000 foot overview of some of the things an individual or a corporation can expect in a government investigation. 
Each of uh, the three topics that I will cover could be discussed for hours, but we only have uh, about 50 minutes to address these topics at a very high level, followed by the 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, please understand that I am not providing attorney-client legal advice to anybody on this webinar. Every situation is unique, and um, my remarks are going to be made in generalities. But let me just say that there is no substitute for calling an attorney when you have legal questions, including questions involving government investigations. And those conversations that you have with a lawyer, unlike this webinar, may be covered by attorney-client privilege. So let's get started. This is supposed to be funny, but it's really very serious. Knock, knock, who's there? And then you can pick one of them uh, on the screen. In all instances, this is not a social call. The federal departments and agencies that you see here uh, can all, all do perform invest government investigations. You're probably familiar with some of the names on here like FBI, Secret Service, DEA, US Marshal, but ICE is part of the uh, um, Department of Homeland Security and HSI is their investigative arm. BATF is alcohol, tobacco, firearms. You all know the IRS, we all know that one. Uh, postal inspectors uh, are, are a very active agency as well as the Department of State, which does a lot of immigration and passport fraud. In addition to all these federal agencies, state, county, and local law enforcement also uh, do, do investigations and have uh, tools available to them. But basically, the, uh, this PowerPoint presentation will uh, involve agencies from the Department of Justice, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and, um, and probably uh, postal inspectors. So what are the common types of uh, government investigations, investigative techniques? And I like to think of this as a toolbox that is used by prosecutors. And the three major tools in this toolbox are agent interviews, that's federal agent interviews, but it could be on a state and local level police interviews, grand jury subpoenas as opposed to civil subpoenas, and search warrants, which in the rest of the world are often called dawn raids. There is another tool in this toolkit, but it's not generally used. Um, it's not as common as the three you see, and those are wiretaps or electronic surveillance. There's two types. There are criminal wiretaps, which um, the FBI and most of the other agencies that I showed you on the prior slide are able to do. And there's the FISA court wiretaps, which we've heard about in the news uh, when we're listening to some political reporting. We're not going to talk about either type of wiretaps in this presentation as a matter of time. But each one of these three tools in the toolkit could be uh, discussed for an hour or more. So. Um, Let's talk about agent interviews versus grand jury subpoenas versus search warrants. We'll go into each one of them in, in some length. The agent interview is normally first, and if, if I had to talk about a danger meter, I would say the agent interviews are kind of like getting a cut on your little finger. Um, but it will determine if there's going to be a federal investigation and whether you as a interviewee could become a person of interest. A grand jury subpoena is more serious in most cases. That's uh, instead of a cut on your little finger, that's more like getting your hand burned by some spattering boiling water. But that means there is a criminal investigation. A grand jury subpoena means there is a criminal investigation. An agent interview may or may not result in a criminal investigation. The most serious tool in this toolkit are search and seizure warrants, or again, what are called dawn raids. And that's like dipping your arm into a vat of boiling oil that is really serious, very, very painful. But you always remember an agent interview can lead to a grand jury subpoena, which can lead to a search warrant. So let's talk about the common types of uh, investigative techniques in the order in which I presented it. That is starting with the agent interviews. Agent interviews can occur anywhere. And when I say agent, I'm talking about a federal agent, an FBI agent, a DEA agent, a State Department agent, they are all um, uh, law enforcement officers. And these agent interviews can occur anywhere. They can occur in your home, your office, when you're on vacation, out of town, if that is if the government knows where you are. And uh, oftentimes, in my experience, at the airport, when you're uh, coming back from wherever it was you visited, especially if it's out of the country. 
very, uh, uh, if an agent calls you up and requests a meeting for an interview, that's probably the best case scenario because there is a decent chance you may not be a person of interest in any uh, ongoing investigation. Yet, when you hear from a federal agent, it's still a good idea uh, and a good practice to call a lawyer before you sit down and uh, consent to an interview. When interviews occur, there are usually two agents, one who takes notes and one who asks questions. And um, as I said before, it's better if it's a scheduled meeting because that way you have a chance to talk to a lawyer first. If it's unexpected and they just show up at your work or your home or at the airport, uh, that's probably a little more serious because that means that the agent probably wanted to catch you by surprise. We'll talk about that in a moment. Usually, almost always, agent interviews are non-custodial. That means there's no arrest. You're not under arrest. You can say, no, I'm not talking to you. And um, because there's no arrest and you're not, not in custody, the agent does not have to give you your constitutional rights under Miranda or Miranda warnings. You're all familiar with that. I'm sure you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may and will be used against you. You have the right to consult with a lawyer before talking. If you cannot afford a lawyer, a lawyer will be provided for you. But that's only if you're under arrest. And if you're not under arrest, you don't get to hear your constitutional rights. In fact, most people who, when confronted by an agent, uh, their first uh, the first thing they think they have to do is cooperate and will consensually answer questions. Uh, most people think I've done nothing wrong and that's why I want to cooperate. Uh, but again, you have the right to speak to a lawyer before you consent to an interview. And if you ever say the magic words, the interview should cease. And the magic words are, I want to talk to a lawyer. So again, if the interview is scheduled, um, you, you should probably ask the agent who calls you, what is this about? And then if the agent won't tell you, you should call a lawyer. If the agent does tell you that it's about a certain subject matter, then you have um, a little more information and you can decide whether or not you should call a lawyer. Uh, but if an agent does meet with you and hands you a grand jury subpoena, I would definitely consider calling a lawyer at that point and uh, terminating the interview. Uh, Again, uh, if, the, if the interview is a surprise, you certainly want to uh, consider calling a lawyer. So um, let's move on to the next slide. And this is more about agent interviews. You'll see I, I put a lawyer on the right-hand side. That's not a real lawyer. That's uh, an actor, William Shatner, but he played a good lawyer named Denny Crane in a TV show called Boston Legal, which you may have uh, seen if you're old enough. I think it was on TV about 12 years ago. The point is when you're speaking to a uh, law enforcement officer or LEO as I wrote, it's really a good idea to have a lawyer sitting next to you. And, and let me explain why, because well, let's be honest, people don't wanna hire lawyers, mainly because it can be expensive. I understand that. I wouldn't wanna hire a lawyer for myself either. And I have hired lawyers for things other than criminal matters and it is expensive. But what a lawyer can do for you is um, prevent you from making damaging admissions or waiving privileges. And we'll talk about privileges in a, in a few moments. The other thing a lawyer can help you do if the lawyer has talked to you ahead of time is stop you from saying things to an agent that are incomplete or not truthful. Remember, a federal agent does not have to be truthful when talking to you. They can trick you and that's not against the law. But if you say something to a federal agent that is material, if you knowingly say something to a federal agent that is materially false or fraudulent, that is a federal felony. And it's punishable by five years, by up to five years in prison, unless it's a uh, statement involving the abuse, sexual abuse of minors or domestic or foreign, or, uh, or foreign terrorism, international terrorism, in which case it's punishable by up to eight years. But I, I said, a few moments ago that one of the things a lawyer can do for you is to help you from waiving a privilege. And let's talk about privileges for a moment. There's really two that are paramount. There's the attorney-client privilege, and that privilege, which I'm sure everyone has heard of, is in effect if there is a confidential communication between a client and an attorney. Now, the client can be an individual 
or the client can be a corporate representative because corporations also have attorney-client privileges. Not just corporations, but um, collective entities of any kind, trade unions. Uh, it could be the uh, Chamber of Commerce as an organization. Uh, organizations have attorney-client privilege. And the, uh, if the confidential communication, and it has to be confidential, that means between you and the lawyer, not between you, the lawyer, and your friend or uh, your mother-in-law or father-in-law or somebody else. It has to be confidential. And it has to be for the purpose of receiving and discussing legal advice. This privilege is the privilege of the client. It's not the lawyer's privilege. The lawyer has to assert it on behalf of the client but it's your privilege and it can be waived by you, by the client, if you ignore uh, any of the elements I talked about, mainly confidentiality. Now there is no privilege if you go to see a lawyer to commit a crime or a fraud, obviously, and no one on this call I'm sure would do that. But um, you have to be very careful that you don't waive the privilege. We'll talk about waiver a little more in a, in a few moments. Actually, let's talk about it now. What is a waiver of privilege? If you meet with your lawyer and have this confidential communication for legal advice, and then after leaving the lawyer, you go have a cup of coffee with your friend at the uh, coffee shop and tell your friend, hey, I just met with my lawyer and this is what we discussed. At that moment, you've done two things. You've waived the privilege and you've made admissions. Now, because you've waived the privilege, the law enforcement or the government can talk to your friend and say, tell me what, uh, was said, or they can talk to you in a grand jury and say, tell us what was said between you and your lawyer because we know you waived your privilege. The other kind of, uh, the, the, the way to think of this is a privilege is a glass filled with water. And if you, if you hold that glass of water, the privilege is intact. If you spill that glass of water into the sand on the beach, you can never get it back into the glass. That's waiver. The other kind of privilege is Fifth Amendment, compulsory self-incrimination. That's if you are in a legal proceeding and um, you say things that waive your privilege, the subject matter of what you're talking about by voluntarily answering questions. That's very proceeding specific, but a closely related concept is an admission. If you make a Fifth Amendment waiver, you're generally making an admission. And if you make an admission, it can be used against you under the rules of evidence. So you have to be very careful when you're talking to your lawyer or talking to anybody else about any kind of uh, legal advice that you've received that you don't waive your privilege. So that was the agent interviews and, and privilege are, are the first tool in the toolkit. Privilege actually will uh, uh, attach to all three of the uh, tools in the toolkit. The next one is the grand jury. And the grand jury is of all the tools in the prosecutor's toolkit, the best tool that the prosecutor has. It's like having the biggest hammer or the biggest wrench or the biggest saw. It is what makes the prosecutor the most powerful person in, the, in government investigations. And the role of the grand jury is not like a trial court. The grand jury is a constitutional body, in the Fifth Amendment, actually. The Fifth Amendment says nobody can be charged with a federal felony unless a grand jury uh, returns an indictment. The Fifth Amendment also said you have the right not to incriminate yourself. Now, when I say you, I'm talking about individuals now, because corporations don't have Fifth Amendment rights. And how do you know if a witness has a Fifth Amendment right? If you can stick a pin into the uh, hand of the uh, witness and blood comes out, there's a Fifth Amendment. You can't stick a pin into a corporation and get blood because corporations, collective entities, do not have a Fifth Amendment right. But the grand jury is not an adversary hearing. You don't have two sides. You don't have your side as a witness and the government side. You have one side, and it's the government side. And as you see from the quote, the um, purpose of the grand jury is to decide if a crime has been committed and who committed the crime. It's, it's a uh, one-sided hearing, and it decides whether criminal proceedings should be brought against somebody. The other thing about a grand jury, unlike a trial, is grand jury proceedings are secret, up to a point. So whatever is said in a grand jury stays in the grand jury, kind of like that old saying, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Except if there's a trial, 
much of what was said in the grand jury can come out into evidence. So um, as I said, this is the best tool in the, in the prosecutor's toolkit. A grand jury room, and this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like, there's a stenographer, there's the witness, there is a table where the, where the prosecutor sits, and there's nowadays a monitor or a whiteboard to show the grand juror's evidence. Before the prosecutor sits down, there's often a magazine rack with newspapers and magazines. The grand jury consists of 21 people, unlike a 12-person trial. And those people decide whether or not to bring an indictment. And an indictment is a formal criminal charge. Grand juries charge felonies. A felony is a type of crime that's punishable normally by more than a year in prison or up to more than a year in prison, as opposed to a misdemeanor, which is normally less than a year in prison. Grand juries don't bother with misdemeanors for the most part, they consider felony presentations. So how does the grand jury process get started? The, an the simple answer is by subpoena. And what you're looking at are three types of subpoenas. I don't know if you can see my cursor on this, but the first one is a civil deposition subpoena. Second is a civil document production subpoena. The third is the grand jury subpoena. A grand jury subpoena may look like the other two. They all kind of look alike when you look at them quickly. And a grand jury subpoena can um, uh, compel production of a person to the grand jury, an individual that is, as well as documents. But at this point, I have to tell you, the grand jury subpoena may look like the other two, but that's where the similarity ends. I like to say a grand jury subpoena, or the other two subpoenas, the civil subpoenas, may look like non-venomous king snakes it, with a certain uh, color patterns on the body. It looks a lot like a, the venomous coral snake pattern. The grand jury subpoena is the coral snake, not the king snake. So what happens if you get the grand jury subpoena? You as an individual or you on behalf of your company or the company you work for. While I can't give you legal advice, I can tell you what good judgment is. And good judgment is when receiving a grand jury subpoena, you get a criminal law attorney, someone who's, uh, who understands what a grand jury subpoena is and how it differs from the first one or the second one. Remember, they're all subpoenas just like, um, let me put it this way. Surgeons and internists are both physicians, right? But you don't want an internist operating on your appendix. You want a surgeon. For the same reason, you don't, want, you necess don't necessarily want your civil lawyer uh, to handle a grand jury subpoena and, and document production. The reason being the penalties are far different. Why? Because a grand jury subpoena means, by definition, this is a criminal investigation. The other two are civil. Nobody goes to jail to the penitentiary in a civil case, unless there's contempt of court, of course, but that's an exception. There can be contempt of court for a grand jury subpoena as well for noncompliance. But this is, the grand jury subpoena is much more serious because noncompliance can lead to other, other things. And we'll talk about some of those things. Um, for example, if a civil subpoena is, is not complied with, you blow it off. There might be a contempt of court, there might be a fine. Blow off a grand jury subpoena, the judge is probably going to sign an order getting whoever the witness into uh, court, possibly fining the witness, uh, unless it's a criminal uh, uh, contempt, in which case the witness can be jailed for noncompliance. But that's the least of it. Blowing off a grand jury subpoena or complying with it in part, in other words, not producing all the non-privileged information which is required to be produced, can lead to other things. It can lead to more agent interviews. It can lead to a search warrant, which we'll talk about in, at great length in a little bit. That's very, very serious because someone who doesn't comply with a grand jury subpoena to the prosecutor is someone who's more than a person of interest. It's a person or a witness who has something to hide. So that's why I strongly recommend if a grand jury subpoena is ever received by a company or by an individual, by an employee of the company, which does happen, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, that a criminal uh, law attorney be engaged to help 
you or your company on how to proceed, how to respond. Remember also, the grand jury subpoena can call for things that are privileged. You may not be in the best position or your company may not be in the best position to know what is privileged. There's a difference, for example, between attorney-client privilege documents and documents that are trade secret documents. You don't want either one of them being disclosed, especially uh, your trade secret documents because that may be the secret sauce to your company. You don't want it, you don't want it getting out, out there. But trade secret's not privileged. Attorney client is privileged. And that's why a lawyer can help negotiate uh, for you, for your company, what the grand jury can look at and what the grand jury cannot look at. And that is something that's usually done lawyer to lawyer between your or your company's attorney and the prosecutor. You don't deal with the um, agents who are serving these things, these processes, because the agents aren't the lawyers who are prosecuting the case. So, as I said before, if a grand jury subpoena, or if any subpoena is, is received by you or your company, uh, the company should talk to its in-house lawyers, or hire outside counsel, uh, and you would do the same. But a grand jury subpoena really requires that you jump on it right away because there may not be that much time in the grand jury subpoena for compliance. You will ordinarily have sufficient time for you to uh, obtain the documents or the other evidence that's requested and get it to the grand jury. Um, many, many times, the grand jury subpoena calls for many hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of documents. Clearly, that's not going to be possible to produce in a couple of weeks. You have to look at it to see if there's privileged documents, like attorney-client privilege. Um, uh, and, and then, through your attorney, hopefully, or the company's attorney, you make a production in what's called a privilege log of documents that you're not producing, but you acknowledge exist, but subject to privilege. So that's what the lawyer can do. The lawyer uh, will uh, uh, help you if you get a grand jury subpoena and you have to go to a grand jury to make sure you don't make admissions in the grand jury, you don't waive attorney-client privilege in the grand jury, and how to ensure compliance with producing documents that are subject to the subpoena. What your lawyer can't do though, or the company's lawyer, is go into the grand jury with you. You're on your own. The lawyer can sit in a little ante room outside the grand jury, and you, the witness has the opportunity upon request to go out and talk to the lawyer, to see if uh, the, uh, a privilege should be asserted, whether attorney-client or Fifth Amendment, as long as you haven't waived privilege before that. Because if you waive the privilege, you probably waive the subject matter, and then the government can pretty much go into whatever it wants. The other thing, and perhaps one of the most important things a lawyer can do for you if you get a grand jury subpoena as opposed to a civil subpoena, is talk to the prosecutor and find out whether the witness, whether an individual or a collective entity, such as a corporation or a, a trade union or any kind of association, is uh, in the mind of the prosecutor, a target subject or other witness. A target is a witness who the prosecutor of the grand jury calls a putative defendant. Without being too legalistic, that means someone or something that's probably gonna be charged by indictment. That's very, very serious. A subject, on the other hand, is almost every other kind of witness, someone who knows something or who has done something that is within the scope of the grand jury's investigation and the grand jury wants to know more about that witness's conduct. The third kind of witness is just like a, it's called other witness. Usually the record custodian from the light company, the phone company, things like that that have to produce records that know nothing about what the grand jury is looking at is just bringing in records. And nowadays, a lot of that can be done through uh, declaration and witness affid and records affidavit. Um, so let's move on. The third tool, and this one is called the search and seizure warrant, or in other countries, um, a dawn raid warrant. And let me stop right here for a moment. A dawn raid in other countries is handled much more um, cooperatively or civilly than a search warrant. The search warrant may have, have looked like the grand jury subpoena or the civil subpoena, but again, it's the poisonous snake. Search warrants are authorized by a judge if a police or the prosecutor present it and show probable cause, which means that there's likely reason to believe that a crime has been committed and the probability that evidence of that crime can be located in the place to be searched. 
if you ever see, and you've seen it on TV probably, in some of the pictures uh, on this uh, PowerPoint, when police or agents show up wearing blue jackets with yellow letters on the back that say federal police or FBI or DEA, whatever, they're not there for a social call. They usually come with guns showing, with their Glock 19s uh, and their AR 15s uh, showing. And that's, it's all very serious. Sometimes there's a helicopter hovering above, especially if it's a corporate search warrant. There's a, uh, vans or trucks to haul off uh, boxes of documents and other evidence. And it's very, very serious. So here's, here's, here's what it might, might look like. And I can tell you on the left here is a search warrant executed on a residence. And you can see there's a fair number of agents, but there's you know, there are a small number of documents being taken out. When it's on a business, that's when you're gonna see the semi-trailers and the vans because they take a lot of stuff out of the business. And this is something that can cripple a business. The photos don't really do justice to what a search warrant execution can look like. I've written many search warrants for agents. Uh, uh, I've gone on search warrant executions, which is when the warrant is served. And it's, it's very, very tense and um, guns are being shown. And you really, when the agents come in with a search warrant, whether it's to a home or a business, they take control of the premises. They take control. You have to be prepared for that. Now, if your business is already prepared for a disaster, let's say it's hurricane disaster, flood disaster, tornado disaster, chances are you have a second, you, you have a server that's off site um, because if your business gets destroyed, the building it's in gets destroyed, you still wanna stay in business. And I would recommend that you, your most important things should also apply to a search warrant because the government can come in and take the computers now or your servers. Nowadays, they usually image them. They bring in external hard drives with terabytes of uh, free space to download everything. When they download everything, they download, they could be downloading not only proprietary information, but attorney client and privileged information, which is why you don't want to negotiate with the lead agent on the search, you want to negotiate with the prosecutor, the lawyer, uh, to say, hey, they're taking some stuff that's privileged, it needs to be sequestered, it needs to be segregated and put somewhere else uh, until we can work that out. And that's really what um, the, a, a lawyer, the highest and best use of a lawyer, because to be perfectly honest with you, um, the, the lawyers have uh, very little to do with a search warrant. If I'm called by a client, as I have been many times, please come to our office, we're being searched. Tell them to stop, tell them uh, to wait. I can't do any of those things. If you're the office manager or it's your business, you can't do it either because you basically have a court order that they're gonna hand to you saying they can search the whole place. Now, if you have a safe, they'll probably say, give us the combination or we're gonna take the safe and break into it. Or if you have uh, uh, computers and uh, they'll say, we're, we're gonna take your computer or we're gonna image it. And um, if you don't tell us uh, what the password is, we're gonna find it out or we're gonna give you a grand jury subpoena and you're gonna have to go to the grand jury. So sometimes you, can, you may want to be somewhat cooperative, but that's the discussion you should have with a lawyer. In other words, if a search warrant is executed on your home, on you, on your business, one of the first calls you ought to make is to your lawyer because there's very little we can do as attorneys other than talk to the prosecutor who's the lawyer for the government and try and work out some accommodations so you don't go out of business while the government's investigating your business. I can't stop your search. I can't direct your search. I can't tell the agents, go sit in the room here until we're ready to uh, receive you. I can't do any of those things. As a matter of fact, the only thing I can do if I, if I try and get in their face is get arrested for obstruction of justice. And I don't want that for me. And I know you don't want that for you. So let's talk about some of these search warrant guidelines that you'll see on this and other pages. And then well, I'll try and quickly go through it to leave time for questions and answers. Um, as Paul said, this uh, PowerPoint will be online in the PDF. So you don't have to take notes. You can actually uh, download this at a later date. 
And you may want to share some of these um, guidelines with the people in your, in your companies because take my word for it, when the police come in, you're not going to remember what to do. I wouldn't remember what to do. But when I wrote these guidelines, I did it with a clear head and some of my clients have taken them and the receptionist has it, the office manager has it, the company executives have them because someone has to be in charge before uh, things get out of hand. So the first thing that needs to be done is who is the lead agent or the law enforcement officer? Who's in charge for the government? And you find out who, what the person's name is. You get his or her name. What is the agency? Is it FBI? Is it DPS uh, uh, in Texas? Is it the California State Police? It could be a, you know any law enforcement agency. Get their credentials, find out who they are, write it down. That's gonna be very important because you're gonna to have to tell people in your company, your people in your company are gonna to have to tell outside counsel. If you hire outside counsel, which I strongly recommend at this point, and the outside lawyer is gonna to have to know who to talk to at the law enforcement agency. You ask for a copy of the search warrant, which you're entitled to, and usually the lead agent will give it to you. Now, a lot of times, before they give you the warrant, and this is something that you have to remember, they'll say, you know, we have a warrant, but if you give us consent, we don't have to serve the warrant. You, that's usually a bad idea to give consent. If, there's a, if they tell you they have a warrant, let them execute the warrant, because once you consent, you sign a form saying, Come, in, come on in, look at whatever you want. Consent and a warrant does not mean that they can take interviews. So that's a thing we'll talk about, another thing we'll talk about in a moment. But it is a good idea to let the lead agent know that you have no reason not to cooperate and if they want a conference room so they can talk to themselves or put evidence in, you'll try and provide a room. Uh, in the meantime, you call your lawyer or the company's lawyer and who will hopefully call outside counsel who knows about, a little more about these things and start a conversation with the prosecutor even as the search warrant is going on. The next thing is that if there is proprietary information like trade secret information and or privileged information, that needs to be told to the prosecutor if, if the prosecutor can be reached, but certainly the lead agent. So you say, this is what we have, which we believe is privileged. This is what we have that we know is proprietary. Please put those in separate boxes off to the side. We'll uh, have our lawyer talk to the prosecutor and try and work that out, but please do not put that where everyone can see it. We're out of business if it gets out, if it's proprietary or trade secret, and if it's attorney client, no one's allowed to look at it anyway. And normally the agents will uh, agree to that, and almost always certainly the prosecutor will. Uh, Another thing is there's going to be non-essential uh, personnel. Ask the government, can they go home? And if they can, you let them go home. But you tell them, do not start emailing about this. Don't talk about this. Basically, keep your mouths closed until we talk to our lawyer, until we can find out what's going on. And then we'll have a meeting at the office. But in the meantime, please don't say anything. Most important, do not, you tell your people, do not, throw away or delete anything while the agents are there. And even after the agents leave, that could be obstruction of justice. Even in a civil case, once a lawsuit's filed, you don't delete or throw away what could be important evidence like emails, because that's called spoliation of evidence and that can be used against you in a civil case as well. The difference is it's not, it may be obstruction of the civil case, but no one goes to prison for it. In a search warrant situation, it could be obstruction of justice and someone could go to prison or at least be charged with indictment by indictment. Sometimes the agents will say, uh, we wanna to talk to some of your people uh, or we wanna to talk to employees. Now, again, remember what we talked about in agent interviews, the first tool in the prosecutor's toolkit. Any employee, any witness has the right to talk to a lawyer before agreeing to talk to a, a law enforcement person. That can be told to your employees, but you cannot say under no circumstances talk to the uh, feds, under no circumstances talk to the police. You do that, then that could be obstruction of justice. You say something along the lines, anyone who wants to consult with a lawyer before agreeing to talk to the law enforcement 
has the right to do so. You can call your own lawyer and the company, if, if you don't have a lawyer, the company will make arrangements for you to have a lawyer. Normally the company will pay for one or two lawyers to talk to employees to give them their legal rights. That's a really good idea for you to do, unlike just uh, telling the employees don't talk. Don't talk can get you in big trouble. Um, do not follow the agents around uh, with a video camera or your uh, smartphone. That will get you in trouble. Um, they can tell you to go to sit down. I've even, uh, I haven't seen it, but I've heard of one case where they handcuff someone to the chair. So you don't want to get in the agent's way. Let them do their job. You don't want them there. You can't wait till they leave, but you don't want to get in their way. So try and take notes of what they're doing. If you see them talking to certain people, uh, employees, make a note to talk to that employee later. What did you discuss with the law enforcement officer? If you hear, overhear something that the agents are saying to themselves, make a note of that so you can share that with uh, the lawyer that's gonna represent you and or your company. Uh, remember, they can take your computers, but probably they'll image them. It's very important for you to try and find out what they've imaged, which standing alone PCs they've looked at or imaged that you're gonna to wanna to do and your lawyer will probably want uh, the company to hire its own forensic experts to see exactly what the government took because you are not going to get access to your evidence for probably for some time. Maybe you, you won't get it back until your lawyer files a motion with the court to at least get a copy of what the government took. You don't wanna be out of business. So you, you may need to get a forensic um, uh, assessment of what was taken. But again, if you have something off site, that may uh, be the answer to uh, what was uh, taken from you so you can still do your business on a daily basis. Before the agents leave, they're supposed to give you something called an inventory of items that were taken. It's called the search warrant inventory. They have to fill it out, the agents have to fill it out and leave it behind. Generally, it's very general. It may say uh, file cabinets in room 12 or without, without going into much more detail. So you'll have an inventory, but it may be almost useless. Do not do the following during the search. Argue or physically interfere with the agents. That will likely get you in a lot of trouble, you or uh, others at your company. Uh, we already talked about don't use a video device to record. Don't challenge the police or the agents about their scope of authority or uh, because if they're there with a warrant, they have authority. If for you to say, I've read the warrant, you don't have the right to go into the uh, uh, building behind, that's probably not going to work either. So remember, the police control the premises while they're executing the warrant, not you. Your lawyer can't stop it at that point. Make sure that your um, employees who are still there are not making unnecessary phone calls or the employees who went home are not making un unnecessary phone calls or discussing this what just happened with uh, anyone else uh, because rumors will get around and, and, and that's not good. The other thing to be aware of is that after there's a search warrant, it is highly likely that a grand jury subpoena will issue to the company and to certain people at the company, probably officers or managers, because what the government doesn't get or what they miss during a search warrant, they're gonna hope to get via a grand jury subpoena. So um, one of the things you're, uh, you, you should be aware of is to make sure that there is a document retention at that point. Do not throw stuff away, especially if a grand jury subpoena has issued. Do not delete from a computer. Your lawyer uh, will advise you how to work with your IT people to make sure that things are not deleted, emails and, and other electronic evidence. Um, and certainly, uh, you may have to actually use a, uh, a storage unit or several rooms in a storage unit to get uh, to put trash in, to store trash for a while because you're not gonna know what you should or shouldn't throw out for a little while. That's something your lawyer can help you with. Talk to the employees, as I said, who were uh, present for the search, who talked to law enforcement, see what that was all about. And tell employees they may get a grand jury subpoena. And as I mentioned before, when the agent drops off a grand jury subpoena, that's a good time for the agent to try and chat it up with your employee uh, and, and 
uh, they'll say, hey, you're not in trouble. We're looking at the company. Answer a few questions for us. Again, the, the employee, the witness, has a right to talk to counsel before deciding whether or not to talk to the agent. And, and um, if it's not in the grand jury, then the employee has the right to uh, be questioned with his or her attorney present. Very, very important. Um, the uh, IT people can take a snapshot of your server um, uh, periodically. So if there is a warrant, you'll have an idea of what's taken and definitely take a snapshot of the home, of the uh, desktops and the uh, servers uh, after a search warrant. So let's talk in the last few moments that I have the difference between a grand jury subpoena and a search warrant. The grand jury subpoena is issued by a prosecutor, can be based on rumors, suspicious. It can be served anywhere in the United States, unlike a civil subpoena, which has, which has a geographic uh, limitation. It, the grand jury subpoena can demand production of evidence on a date time certain subject to negotiation. You can ask the government, can we produce part, you know, uh, prioritize what we're going to produce? Can we have more time? That's something your lawyer can do for you. Privileged documents can be uh, separated and uh, adjudicated by your lawyer in front of a federal judge or a state judge if necessary. Non-compliance with a grand jury subpoena can, can lead to an issuance of a search warrant. The search warrant, on the other hand, has to be issued by a judge, not a prosecutor. Uh, it must be executed within the judicial district. For example, I'm speaking to you from the Southern District of Texas, which goes from College Station down to the border in Mexico. Uh, the seizure of evidence that's covered by the warrant will be subject to immediate seizure. It's not like a grand jury subpoena. They don't come in when you get a grand jury subpoena and take everything. That's what a search warrant is. That's the difference. Privileged documents might be seized by the search warrant, but uh, hopefully can be negotiated to be separated and sequestered uh, until a later date. Uh, and maybe if the government's gonna look at it, then they have a, what's called a clean team of agents or prosecutors that are not involved in the investigation. They can say, yes, this is uh, proprietary. Yes, this is privileged. And following the execution of a search warrant, a cleanup grand jury subpoena may issue. So that's pretty much what I have for you right now. Uh, I've used up most of my allotted time or all of my allotted time. So Paul, if you could uh, tell me if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on board. A lot of good information. Uh, there are questions here, so I'm going to just go through some of the questions. Um, one of the questions says, um, your statement about federal agents not being required by law to be truthful, does this extend to other federal agencies, such as FDA? If it's a federal investigation um, that has any kind of, well, let me back up. Some agents have civil and criminal responsibility. The FDA um, does have its own uh, investigators. Normally, they are not uh, most of them are not criminal uh, investigators. They are more likely to be truthful with you. But criminal investigators, um, uh, and I'm thinking of the uh, Bluebell case that uh, was re recently in the news. It was an FDA investigation, and the FDA um, normally works with uh, other agencies like the FBI, or uh, although they do have their own investigators. But again, there is no law that says they have to be completely truthful. You have to be, we have to be completely truthful. Investigators, unless it's really egregious, uh, tend to, uh, not all the time, but on occasion, will stretch the truth. And that's something that uh, is, is troublesome, but you have to be uh, cautious. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, I'm an interpreter frequently assisting attorneys in conducting interviews. Is the conversation between the attorney and, and their client through an interpreter privileged by, is protected by privilege? In other words, can anyone be subpoena, uh, subpoena uh, the uh, interpreter's notes during a criminal investigation? If an interpreter is hired by an attorney for the witness, then the, the notes ought to be covered by the attorney-client privilege. If you are not an attorney and you hire your own interpreter to translate what the FBI agent's telling you, for example, that is not privileged. There's no attorney involved. Even if the agent, some FBI agents are lawyers, but that doesn't make it privileged. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, I'm just gonna go down the question. Just to confirm, it's illegal to provide untruthful information to a prosecutor, but to an investigator, 
but it's it, it's legal to the investigator prove untruthful information to the interview. So that's just confirming sometimes, that's, yeah. Is that yeah so, sometimes agents will, uh, or police will trick someone saying they have evidence they really don't have yet. Uh, and that's not a crime. Uh, it, it may be brought up in court. Certainly the uh, agent, if it's in court, the agent can't lie in court. If they're on the stand, they're sworn to tell the truth like any other witness. But I think I answered that question uh, two or three questions ago. Yeah, thank you. Um, for an agent interview, do you need a criminal lawyer or a civil lawyer? Well, it depends. If, it's, if the agent is involved in a civil, um, let's say an FDA or uh, uh, a medical device thing, um, and, and, uh, and, and they're there for what's ostensibly a civil reason, then it's probably okay to have your civil lawyer. But remember, anything that is civil can turn criminal, almost anything. So if the FDA is there, uh, or um, HHS is sending someone out from the IG's office and they're, they're uh, looking at a doctor, for example, that is um, prescribing anti-cancer uh, or, or cancer medication. And, and let's say it, uh, it came from India and, and, and that could be a crime to, to use that in this country. Mm. Would you want your civil lawyer there or would you want a criminal practitioner there? Uh, <laughs> Oftentimes, people with my background get hired by civil lawyers who are saying, this is, looks like it might be going criminal. I don't want to compromise my client. Will you work with me on this? And in most of my representations, I work, or at least half of them, I'd say I work with civil lawyers who represent uh, the same clients who've gotten me involved in the representation. Okay. No, thank you. Um, I'm just going to, there's a couple more questions, and I know we're almost close to time, but I do want to answer these questions. Am I obligated to surrender my cell phone, personal and business, during the search warrant? And yet, the second following that, am I obligated to give you know my passwords to the search officer or emails for my emails and cell phone? 